She was 36 years old and she'd been married since she was in her early 20s and they've been trying over 15 years. Nothing worked and so she's totally infertile. I said, I just need to warn you that because the amount of soluble fiber that you're going to be eating to correct this gallbladder problem, said so that's really what you had an overproduction of your female hormones and that's what's created your infertility problem. You just need to be aware that you probably could become pregnant. She laughed. She said, no, there's nothing that's going to help that. I said, well, you're fair warned, you know. Anyway, her gallbladder healed and guess what? She became pregnant. Hello, welcome back to the You're Great podcast with your host, Unique Hammond. Gosh, I love this podcast, and sometimes I get so busy that it gets away from me, but thank you for staying with me and being a part of this wonderful community. I have to say what I am constantly reminded of is that great health is simple, which makes it so hard, because I think there's a part of us that thinks, there's a secret out there to great health, and I just need to find it. And oftentimes the secret is getting enough of the right things so that our body is supported and can be resilient and can do the work on our behalf because we've done the work on the behalf of our body. So the Bean Protocol has been my ride or die for the last 11 plus years. I have been in remission from Crohn's disease naturally for nine plus years. And it's just pretty magical. I do run groups. I offer private consultations. My next 12-week women's group runs in September, potentially January. I haven't quite nailed that down yet, but I do have a wait list going, so we'll see what happens. Um, I'm about to finish up this last group. It's been incredible. I have to say, one of the things that struck me is everybody goes through a healing process differently. And some of us heal our body while others go through this entire transformation of body, mind, and spirit. And it's absolutely phenomenal to watch the unfolding of each person on their healing journey. Today, I sit with my mentor, my friend, Karen Hurd, to answer a bunch of Q&A from my community that I crowdsourced and a bunch of questions from my own groups that I run. So I hope you enjoyed today's podcast, and I look forward to seeing you in the community. Thanks for being here. Karen, welcome back to the podcast. As always, a pleasure to have you on. This podcast, I've sourced a lot of questions from the community, Beanie community, and everybody always gets so excited. They're like, yay, we get to hear from Karen. So how are you today? I am well, thank you. Wonderful. I'm happy to hear that. So the question I had when we were chatting earlier was, you know, in the course of your 35 years of helping people through dietary changes, what were some of the major health transformations that you've witnessed? A lot of people are talking about autoimmune conditions, thyroid conditions, osteoporosis. I spoke to somebody you worked with in Africa who was late kidney disease that you helped. I would love to just hear some of your experiences firsthand. Lots and lots have been doing this for three decades. And so it's every type of gastrointestinal disorder you can possibly imagine, whether that's cyclical vomiting, whether that's just gastroesophageal reflux disease, which they call GERD or acid reflux, ileitis, any type of ulcerative colitis, all kinds of mental health problems with anxiety, depression, women's health, PMS, uterine fibroids, fibrocystic breast disease, postpartum depression, infertility. I've helped so many people with infertility, gallbladder disease. It's everything that you can possibly think of whether it's psoriasis and skin disorders like eczema and rashes and allergies, histamine reactions, um, multiple chemical sensitivities. Some people have EMF that's a electromagnetic frequency sensitivities. All of that can be helped. Something like diverticulitis. What I understand is it really is a lack of fiber in the, in the diet. And that's the first thing they tell you to stay away from is fiber. It's because it gets caught in those little out 
pockets. And so, but that's insoluble fiber. So many people don't understand the difference between insoluble fiber and soluble fiber. Soluble fiber, there's no big pieces, you know, there's nothing, there's no cellulose. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. And and I obviously with autoimmune Crohn's, it was healing, not just the digestive tract, my small intestine where I was really infected, but it was also really working with the immune system, which I think about a lot of times, because as you, as you've told me, the gut heals in three to four day increments, right? So the lining isn't the problem with Crohn's autoimmune. It's also the autoimmune malfunction that was going on is, and so maybe immune system takes longer to heal and course correct than the linings of the intestines. Would you say that's about right in that, in a case like that? Now, there are some things that definitely take longer and depending on what the cause is. I mean, if you didn't have an autoimmune gastrointestinal disease, then it can go pretty rapidly. And then so many things to heal. I've seen over and over in my practice that you're treating one thing, but that's going to make everything else as a side benefit. They all get better. For instance, I had a woman who came to me and she had severe gallbladder disease and she had stones. And I said, we can dissolve the stones. We can take care of this gallbladder disease. I said, and she'd also, I take a full history when somebody comes and she had been infertile. She was 36 years old and she'd been married since she was in her early twenties. And they've been trying all these years, over 15 years, done everything that was they're supposed to do and nothing worked. And so she's totally infertile. And so I said, I just need to warn you that because we're going to be treating your gallbladder and the amount of soluble fiber that you're going to be eating to correct this gallbladder problem. So that's really what you had an overproduction of your female hormones. And that's what's created your infertility problem. So you were probably, you just need to be aware that you probably could become pregnant. So if that's not something you want to have happen at now you're 36 and you've tried all these years, then, you know, just be aware of that. She laughed. She said, no, there's nothing that's going to help that. I said, well, you're fair warned, you know. <laughs> anyway, her gallbladder healed and guess what? She became pregnant. No way. And so, yes, she also became pregnant and gave birth to a healthy little boy. And then she's had two more children since then. Those children are now all in their teens. And everywhere I go, they say, you're the reason I see them because they live locally. You're the reason that I'm even here, you know? Oh. So, yeah. I mean, it's really interesting that they're, that, that a gallbladder disease uh, and, and just lack of soluble fiber in your diet would cause this almost like a, a backup of female hormones in the, in the bile. Right. So there's, it's just, that's causing- exactly what happened. Yeah. If, if you have gallbladder disease, see all those hormones are cleared through the gallbladder. Yeah. And so if you're not clearing them, then they keep recycling. And then what most people don't understand about how gallbladder disease works is that is that it changes the pH as you keep recycling these things and the pH changes. And when you change the pH, pH is just a negative log of, of, of hydrogen ions. And when you start to change that, then you have more concentration of hydrogen ions and those hydrogen ions, they actually will change the physical state of your bile. So your bile is a liquid, but if you keep pumping it full and your the pH changes and it changes with all those hormones and, and that's where they're going through, then your bile will start to solidify. It gets really sludgy, little grains of sand start to form and then eventually it rolls into these balls and we call them stones and all that is is just the bile that's become too hydrogenized i mean it's just way too many hydrogen items and ions in there and so what we had to do is take the soluble fiber because that is going to cause new bile to be released that is not full of that has a different pH and then that is what actually dissolves those stones those stones go away and at the same time you are throwing away all these excess hormones that were the reason that the stones formed so all that goes away too and so those excess hormones are what kept her from becoming pregnant it wasn't that she was infertile or she didn't release eggs because she was having a menstrual cycle. It was because those eggs were overly ripe. And mm-hmm. so as soon as they erupted out of, there's a little follicle that they erupt out of in the ovary at that force of eruption, that was so, for, because it's a forceful, they don't just sort of squeeze out or just sort of just float. Out. <laughs> they are ejected out of that follicle and that force of ejection, because it's such an overly ripe, think of any piece of overly ripe fruit, an an ovum that's a little 
human egg, if it gets overly ripe, it's like any overly ripe fruit. And it just, with any pressure, it just poof, bursts mm -hmm. into a million pieces. And then there's nothing to fertilize. So you say, well, I'm having menstrual cycles, but I can't, I guess I don't have any eggs. And no, you have the eggs, but they're all overly ripe. And as soon as they erupt, they completely disintegrate, literally. And then, so there is nothing left to fertilize. So you don't become pregnant. And that is the number one cause of infertility. It's not underproducing where you don't erupt an egg. Because if you're having a menstrual cycle, you are erupting an egg. Because see, what produces progesterone for you in a, in a woman's body? What produces progesterone is that little follicle. The corpus luteum is what's a, a technical name of it. The corpus luteum then produces the progesterone. But if there's no corpus luteum, there's no follicle from which an egg erupted, there will be no progesterone. If there's no progesterone, you will never have a menstrual cycle. So when women have a menstrual cycle, they have ovulated and all this garbage that you hear from all kinds. And I hear it from professionals, from MDs. I hear this too. It's just like, do you not know anything about biochemistry <laughs> and hormones? And if you really looked at this, you're just thinking, you're not thinking outside the box because if you have a menstrual cycle, you have to have something that produces progesterone to have that menstrual cycle. And the only thing that produces progesterone in a female body is that corpus luteum the follicle from which an egg erupts. And then there is one other place, but you have to be pregnant to get that. The placenta will make progesterone, but placenta only happens when you're pregnant. What happens in the case, just to follow this thread for a minute, what happens in the case of a woman who gets pregnant, but her body doesn't produce enough progesterone to hold the pregnancy? Like what, what's happening there? Is it that she's not producing enough progesterone or she's producing too much? Oh, interesting. That, but, wow. Because what doctors do today is they say, you have, you know, multiple miscarriages. So therefore we're going to, you know, you have low progesterone because you measure, you can actually measure the progesterone. It should be like this, but it's not. So we're going to give you progesterone, mm -hmm. but you have to be very, very careful because what is, what have we used, not currently, but what did we use several decades ago to create a miscarriage on purpose that we would say, we want to miscarry. We want to have a chemical abortion. What did you give them? Did progesterone. You give them? Really? Just room. But and you that's also the have very to thing that they're giving them to hold pregnancies right now that they that Yes. And so you have to be very careful that you're not giving too much. And you also have to be very careful about the timing because most people don't realize this either. But there is a point in the development of that little child after the egg has been fertilized that they're going to go through a time where they will differentiate into a male or a female. And so that is that is a certain cleft. And so there's, and it's just in the very early stages, if you are taking progesterone during that time, then you can actually have a phenotype of the opposite sex than what you really are. And so a phenotype is different from a genotype. A genotype says you have a Y chromosome or you don't. Okay, so, you know, we have, so you're a male or female because of your chromosome or lack of chromosome. But when you have a phenotype, then you actually develop the characteristics of that opposite sex. And that happens very specifically from progesterone that is documented in every endocrinology textbook that is out there. But yet we just, you will never hear that ever explained to a woman. It's just like, no, get on progesterone. It's like, do you understand that you could be creating a child that has a lot of difficulties? It's born with a blind vagina that is born without testicles. What it's causes a woman to miscarry at six or eight weeks, which is very, the common, like that seven week, eight week or, or six week time. Isn't that the time that the progesterone should be really coming in? What, what is it genetic factors that the body would kick out a pregnancy at that point? There's two main reasons. The top reason is that their their hormones are out of balance. They could be producing, and most women are producing too many hormones. And I'm saying most women, and I'm going to specify the United States because I'm not studying global, you know, like what's right. happening in Nigeria or right. you know what's happening in India or something because they have different diets and a whole different lifestyle. But in the United States, we are over producers of hormones just in general especially women, because women really load up with perfume all the time. Everything that they do, their hair, 
everything. You know, when I say their hair, you know, they wash their hair, they wash their clothes and scented everything. And those scents always increase your hormonal production. Stress increases your hormonal production. Caffeine just drives your hormonal production off the roof. Sweets, chocolate, all, all of these things drive up your hormonal production. So you're already an overproducer and you become pregnant and you're overproducing progesterone or estrogen, then yes, you can miscarry. That's your imbalance of hormones. Mm -hmm. The second reason it could be a blighted ovum. That means there was something wrong with the egg. Okay. And that cannot be changed. There is nothing that nutrition, you know, I said, I don't deal with any traumatic injury like car wrecks or broken bones or something. You cannot fix no one. There is no one on this face of the earth. Only God can fix a blighted ovum because those ovum are placed inside that woman's ovaries when she was in her mother's womb. When she was a little tiny fetus inside the womb and those ovaries, that's when those eggs develop. And if one of them just sort of was malformed, and that's the one who happens that erupts and gets fertilized. That's called a blighted ovum. And there's nothing that anybody can do. But that's okay. the secondary cause. The primary cause is because we're we're overproducing hormones. That's the bottom line. So what is the, I'm going to stay with this for a minute, because one of the questions was about hypothalamic amenorrhea, the loss of a cycle. Would you assume that would be an underproducer of hormones or could you be overproducing one hormone to cause this? I mean, you know, we give women, we give them estrogen, you know, pills and you take that all the month, you know, you don't have a break there. And then, but it keeps you from, if you have too many hormones, it can stop your cycle. If you have not enough hormones, in that case, most of those are from women that are sports, sports lovers and that they, you know, they start in junior high and they're on the track team. They do swimming, basketball, whatever the sport is that they're doing. And they're highly involved. And they usually see that they have irregular menstrual cycles. They may even have a delay in, through puberty, depending on when they started their exercise, if they started, say, in middle school. And then, so as they get older and they get into their twenties and they say, now I want to have babies. Then they say, why can't I have a menstrual cycle? Well, because you used all those hormones in all those years to be able to lift weights, run track, play basketball, whatever it was, men can go do those things. They don't have to have a monthly menstrual cycle. They don't have to ripen an egg and have that erupt and then possibly have that, you know, implant on a, a uterine wall. They don't go through any of that. Basically, when a man goes through puberty, a boy goes through puberty, he's, he's set and steady for the entire rest of his life, even when he gets to be an old man. And so women, we have this monthly haranguing of the hormonal ups and downs. And actually we go through two ups and downs in a month because we have to have ovulation. Then we have an immediate drop off of estrogen. Then you have to have a second peak of estrogen to be able to carry out that menstrual cycle. And then here comes the progesterone. And then, you know, and then you repeat that. So we say it's a 28 day cycle, but you really only have about two good weeks before you're right back in it with the crazy production of hormones again. And so that is a major work. We're completely different. And so we have to realize that. And so when we go through this monthly cycle, this is huge. It's huge work. And so then when you're doing that and you're also running track and you're doing all these extra sports things and you are the athlete of the year woman, I'm not saying don't do this, but I'm just saying women beware, especially young women, because I've worked with dozens and dozens and dozens of them that come out of a very athletic career and they say, I want to, now I'm in my 30s, but I can't even have a cycle. Well, yes, because you haven't made the hormones in years and years and years because you're too busy making the other hormones so that you could go run. Is it a body fat issue or is it you, you're you taxing your adrenals and making so much epinephrine and norepinephrine that you're blunting the signaling to the body that, hey, we don't, we don't need to ripen an egg? Like what is, is there just a breakdown in the communication system? Because I'll meet women who don't have a cycle, they have healthy body fat, they're not working out avidly, but their but their period's been gone. It disappeared for a year. It's the epinephrine and the norepinephrine. It's not the body fat because you okay. can have women that are very thin. They get pregnant and they don't have basically. They, I can't say they don't have any body fat. We all have a little bit, but I mean, you know, that's very little. And then you have women that are overweight and they all get pregnant the same. Right. It's 
it is the amount of epinephrine and norepinephrine that you're making. And so these women say are that are not exercising, they're not, you know, underweight, you know, they're, there's no reason why then look at the stress levels in their life. Look mm -hmm. at how much caffeine they're drinking. Okay. So, so the hypothalamic amenorrhea is most likely you're going to look to the adrenals for why there's a, a disconnect going on there. Yeah. I mean, because unless do you have a tumor on the hypothalamus, you know, right. no, the hypothalamus and the pituitary, they form an axis. They talk to each other constantly. And so the hypothalamus is saying, okay, is the director and saying, pituitary, you need to release stimulating hormones to tell the ovary to make estrogen, to tell the ovary to make progesterone, to tell the adrenal glands to make a more epinephrine or norepinephrine or whatever hormone, the thyroid, we need more because the hypothalamus is controlling all hormonal production and sending messages to the pituitary, who is then the, the sergeant that carries out the orders to all the troops and say, you do this and you do this and you do this because the hypothalamus, the brain, hypothalamus is part of your brain, told me that we didn't have enough of this particular hormone or we had too much of it because it can also shut down the production of these things. And so it's really the health. And remember, your glands can only take so much. It, it, we're human. We are, we're like grass to be thrown into the fire. I mean, that's how frail. I mean, we're re remarkably made. But I mean, it, we if you don't get enough sleep, guess what? You're tired and you're grouchy and you fall apart and you can't handle the same stress that you handled just a little while before. And guess what? If you're hungry and you don't eat for a while, your whole life just falls apart. You have headaches. You don't feel well. You cannot think straight. It's like you have to have food. You have to have rest. You have to take care of this marvelous machine, your body. And if you don't take care of it, then don't be surprised when it has all kinds of hiccups and backfires on you. Yeah. So, so then you would, so even though you're not getting a period, it's very likely that you would still go into an overproducer plan because of the amount of adrenaline you're pumping. Talk to each one of those people. And I say, give me your, give me some history. Okay. So you don't have a, a period. Tell me about the years before that. And mm -hmm. they'll say, oh, I was in a high stress marriage or, you know, I came through a rough, abusive teen, you know, years or whatever their story is. And it's always high stress. Okay. So or you they put them on a biggest. high stress plan. Okay. They're constantly in fight and flight now because so many of these people come out of backgrounds. And so you're in a constant fight or flight. I think that you can identify that because I think you were, you, you had some of that in your own life. Unique. Yeah. I was so, really surprised that my period didn't leave when I was so sick and 90 pounds and working with you. I'm like, why am I still getting a period? This seems unfair. <laughs> Couldn't you take a break? Could you not take a couple months off? Go on vacation. Like, give, give me a break. Like, I remember being awake and I just being like, please don't come this month because everything gets worse when you're out of whack that hard, you know, with so much inflammation. I was like sending little notes to my ovaries. I'm like, please don't ovulate this month. But it just wouldn't. I, I didn't get a break when I was really sick. I was, because it was like, from ovulation through cycle, I would have one good week a month because it was such, it was so inflammatory. And then my Crohn's would just flare three weeks out of every month. So it's interesting that I could have been that sick and 90 pounds and you're right. I didn't have any body fat and my body was still ovulating. And I'm like, who's getting pregnant in this state? I'm like crazy, craziness. It's such a mystery. The body is so known and yet such a mystery. Like well, I wondered about that all the time. Why did I keep getting cycles when I was so sick? Like, didn't the body get the message? Like, Hey, shut down production, nothing going here, guys. That's interesting. So a hypothalamic situation doesn't mean that there's an underproduction of hormones. There means that there most likely is a flooding of stress hormones that is causing the body to just shut down and say, Hey, we're not, we're not ovulating. Fascinating. Yeah, that is generally the reason. There are a few cases that you are underproducing, but in our society, I mean, you know, we hear about the women that were in the concentration camps in World War II. They were not unique. They were not well treated. I mean, there yeah. was all kinds of sexual abuse and rapes. And why didn't they have these massive amounts of pregnancies and babies? These women were under such high stress. You think about fight and flight hormones, you were under a lot of high stress and your, your adrenaline is pumping constantly. That's an overproduction of hormones, but that shut down that, that cycle. That communication so, cycle. 
Mm-hmm. All right. Another person said they're hearing a lot about peptide treatments and is curious your take on that, where people are injecting peptides for immune system, for fertility. Um, it's, it seems really experimental to me. I'm curious if you've, if you've been tracking this trend right now that everybody's getting into. Yeah. It's another trend. It's another fad is a, probably a better word for it as a fad. Peptides are something that we make. Peptides are ubiquitous in everything that we eat and do, and the body makes plenty of them. Mm-hmm. So we're going to inject these things into ourselves. It's like, well, let's inject ourselves with water because water is an amazing thing. Well, you could just drink it too. You can eat foods. You can, you know, you can, you'll be fine. You know, we're reaching for, it is so classic, unique. I see it all the time and you do too, is that you have some type of health problem. And instead of looking at, you know, I really shouldn't be eating so poorly. And that's, those are difficult changes to make. They're really difficult, but wouldn't it be nice if there was just some miracle pill or some miracle injection, some miracle IV, some miracle just will put it in and this substance is going to fix everything. Peptides are just one tiny little piece of chemical reactions that happen. We're talking trillions that happen per nanosecond. It's just like, there are so many pieces why you're, you know, there is no miracle anything, even beans, you know how I emphasize beans, soluble fiber is important, but people a lot of times think, well, if I just add beans to my diet, everything will get better. No, you have to stop the caffeine. You have to stop sugar. Oh, and don't forget, you have to have some efficient protein and it would be very good for, you know, you go through all the things and get rid of your perfumes and, you know, it's, it's a multifaceted, it's a lifestyle change. This is you're really becoming well. So you're looking at these things more as, as trying to take shortcuts versus just show up for the important foundational things like diet and lifestyle changes. Yeah, it's interesting. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. and then lipidemia. Somebody asked your thoughts and how protocol might help lipidemia. Okay, well, lipidemia, you may have to qualify that word. I don't know if a, lipidemia is high cholesterol. So there is an, another one where you store fat under your skin too. And that's a slightly different spelling too, but I don't know if they're talking about high cholesterol. High cholesterol is easy to bring down. They just it's, have fat to under, it's fat under the skin. It's like both legs. Right. Like you'll get that kind of like bigger lower body. Oh, um, you're getting the lipomas. Yeah. So it's, it's more the lipomas. Yeah. So that is all that fat underneath the skin is made out of triglycerides. Triglycerides are a storage form of fat that's made from blood glucose. So when you have too much blood glucose circulating in your bloodstream, then your body will convert it into this fat called a triglyceride, and then it will store it. And it's typically stored just underneath the skin. And then you have these, you know, these fatty deposits and they'll say, look at my legs. They look like, you know, marbled fat. And well, yeah, that's just the way we fatten up animals too, is we give them a lot of grain more than they need. And grains are carbohydrates. And so it's converted into triacylglycerols. It's the same as triglycerides. So what's the answer? Soluble fiber. You have to eat the soluble fiber because the soluble fiber will carry out your bile. What is bile made out of? Bile is made out of triglycerides. So when the triglycerides in your bloodstream fall below a certain level, it's usually 60 and below. If they fall below 60, then your body says, we don't have enough triglycerides to make new bile. And she keeps eating these beans and throwing all the bile away. We have to have some raw material to make bile out of. Oh, you know, on those thighs down there, she's got a lot of fat that we store there, you know, and those little lipoma deposits. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pull those and that's easily, they just have those just release into the bloodstream and the liver gathers them up, turns them into bile. You eat more beans and you throw it away. But that's the way you get rid of it. Will it happen in a week? No. And everybody wants it to happen in a week, maybe a month. They'll give it a month. But after a month, if this not cleared up, well, this is ridiculous. It's just like, guys, how long did it take you to get here? At least 20 years or however old you are, you know, before you start to notice those type of things. It's just like, you need to give it a little time to reverse. And then it means changing a lot of other things too, because then you'll say, well, okay, I'll eat beans, but I'm still going to do my coffee and my sweets. It's like, okay, we're not getting very far. 
Everybody's negotiating the the poor habits, unfortunately. You know, it's interesting. A client of mine recently said that all of her cellulite went away. And she was like, you need this is amazing. I had all the cellulite and it just disappeared since I've been on the beam protocol. So it's really interesting to think that if you're carrying it in a place, maybe that's a genetic place for the body to put those fat stores. But if you're removing it all the time, then slowly... And I've had a few clients over the years say, you know, as a side note, I don't have any cellulite. And I was like, are you okay with that? And they're like, yeah, I'm really okay with that. That's fine. But it's really not, it wasn't something that they expected, nor, nor did I, like, I never think about it really quite honestly, but that's really interesting. So that the same thing you would do for an overproduction of hormones would be the same thing you would do to get rid of these e extra oh, fat know, like, deposits. Like on, those, you know, on those fat deposits. Yeah. Yeah. And so some people actually have dozens, dozens, even hundreds of lipomas where they're little fatty lumps, you know, yeah. several under their on forearm, they're on their back, they're on their chest, they can be anywhere on your body. Yeah. And they're like, what? what are these little fatty, you know, they'll go and they say, well, for all these, are they tumors? No, that's just fat. And that's all they are. It's just fat. Interesting. So it's easy interesting. You know, the big mm -hmm. question that came in so many times is to not just explain what is a varicose vein, what's going on there, but is there any way through nutrition to reverse it, heal it, not get them? We have two systems. Our blood travels in arteries and in veins and capillaries too. But so the arteries are um, pushing out fresh blood that's oxygenated. We have to have oxygen to every tissue because that's the only thing that's going to be able to create these chemical reactions. We have to have oxygen. So the arteries are carrying this oxygen-rich blood. Well, then when that oxygen is used up, it has to go back to the heart to get re-oxygenated so that we can put more oxygen in the blood and send it back out. If we don't do that, people die. You, that's the way that we work. That's the circulatory system. The used up blood, or it's not used up, the blood is still there, but the oxygen, oxygen less blood, that's a really dark red. By the way, the one that has oxygen is a really bright red. Okay, so that dark red blood has to be taken back to the heart. Well, in the extremities, especially the legs, and because they're at the lower part of the body, how do you pump? that blood all the way up your legs, up your torso and back to your heart so it can get oxygen in it. You have to have a way for it to climb back up the hill. And that's what veins are. And they have little, I'll call them flanges. Think of a tube. On the inside of the tube, you have little flanges that point up like little Christmas tree branches, you know, that are extending into that open space of the tube. And so then the blood can go up and then it catches on one of those flanges so it won't fall back down because we have gravity. Gravity is always going to pull 9.82 meters per second squared. You're pulling down your blood. And so you have to have a little shelf for the blood to rest on. So we, with each pump of the heart, pump. oh, we got up to the next step in the next level, up or next to the little flange. We're, we're climbing, we're climbing, we're climbing. When those, those flanges become weak, and they begin to not be strong anymore, then they sort of can collapse. And so then the blood just all falls down. And so, because it's not going up anymore, that can just pool in the veins. And when it pools, it makes the veins become very big and they can become swollen because they're expanding because they're only supposed to be so wide. There's a diameter is set. Well, if you just let a lot of blood pool there, well, then that vein has to expand. And when you expand and stretch it out, it damages the wall, which damages those little flanges coming out even more. And then it becomes painful because it's all stretched out and it's inflamed and what a mess it is. So we have to look at inflammation and what's the major cause of this happening is that your blood is basically too thick. Why should, because blood can be thick or thin and not your blood, I'm not water. Saying, not drinking enough water is one of the main reasons. Yes. Think about where do you, and then, and then when you're also overweight, because when you're overweight, you have a lot of weight pressing down on your legs. So it's even a more arduous task to climb the hill back up to the heart. And if you have a job where you're on the feet, you're a cashier at the store. And all you do is stand there for eight hours checking people out and you never sit down, you never put your feet up. 
how much opportunity do you get a chance to put your feet up? Just sit down and put your feet up. It's a huge change. So if you have varicose veins, you have to sit down and put your feet up as often as you can. And then you have to drink enough water. And you think about pregnant women. You always see this happening with pregnant women. What are they doing? They're gaining weight. And they have a lot of pressure on their lower extremities because they're carrying more weight. And pregnant women hardly ever drink enough water. And they need more water than ever because their blood flow is massively increased because now they're circulating blood through a second person's body besides their own. So they're they're not getting enough, you know, water. They're too much. And I'm not saying that you you can be pregnant and not overweight. I'm not saying that you're overweight when you're pregnant, although some women are overweight and pregnant too. But it's just that additional weight. You know, if you are a five foot six woman and you should be only weighing 125 pounds, 130 at the most, and all of a sudden you're weighing 180, whoa, that's, you know, that's a lot of 50 pounds extra weight. That's just like a real uphill battle. It's water, it's hydration, and, and it can be weight related, but it sounds like there's a fair amount to do with hydration. Yes. Yes. How fascinating. And then inflammation too, and inflammation, because some of the damage to those flanges, those little Christmas tree branches sticking up, you know, at different levels, they become inflamed. And when something is inflamed, it does not do its job properly anymore. I just, the best way, I, you know, people, know, a lot of people think, well, if it, it's still there, so it's still function. No, think about your hand. My hand is in good shape. If I slammed it into the car door, and now my whole hand is tripled in size. It's swollen and inflamed because it's damaged because it got smashed in the car door. How well am I going to be able to hold the pen or the pencil? Mm -hmm. How well am I really going to be able to be on my keyboard, on my computer and make my fat, hurting, inflamed fingers work? I can't. I can't sew with a needle. I can't. I, you can't use your hand because it's too inflamed and swollen. So your hand is now useless, no longer does its job. Mm. When we have inflammation in different parts of the body, the parts that are affected no longer are able to do their job. So if you have inflammation, and, and what is causing inflammation? They're called by adipokines or the most common source, but any there's several things that cause inflammation, different chemical substances that we make, but they mainly come from eating too much sugar and too many saturated fats. Is it our processed foods in there as well or not really like more saturated fats and sugars? No, the processed foods itself, unless they're high fat, if you're eating a Twinkie, you know, Twinkie is just like a fat bomb, you know. A lard bomb. Oh, so it's a lard bomb. It's a lard bomb. Yeah, lard is all fat. You know, it used to be people are, you know, I've even seen commercials, you know, this is what the kids used to carry to school. They were lard sandwiches, you know, two pieces of bread with a thick layer of lard because lard, you know, you had pigs, you had, you know, you had beef and they were, were rendered down the lard. And, and so that's what was used. And yes, and our people died at earlier ages because that was a lot of saturated fat. So saturated fat is a major cause of inflammation. And then sugar is right next to it. I mean, it's a major cause because that causes a release of adipokines. The other one causes a release of different enzymes that create the inflammation. So, so it's yeah. dehydration, inflammation, weight, standing potentially on feet all day, and maybe combined with poor hydration, and potentially poor diet choices as well. It sounds like like varicose veins are kind of a multi pronged potential issue there. It's a multi pronged yes. And so you look at each case and say, well, you know, you're not on your feet all day long, you, you know, and so and you're not pregnant and you're not overweight, so you must have some inflammation going on. Mm -hmm. What are you eating? Oh well, I eat bacon every morning, and I, you know, I love those fried pork rinds. Whoa, are those fried pork rinds? We you know, you know what a pork rind is. It's pig skin. Do you know what pig skin is made out of? One hundred percent fat. Yeah. It's all fat, saturated fat. So I mean, you know, they sell, I, they sell. You know, a lot of paleo and Weston A. Price sell saturated fat as stable fat. So it makes people sound like, oh, this is a really good thing that we're getting the stable fat. And you know, unfortunately you know, it's hard to get people off of that idea of like, oh, if it's stable, it's really good. I know they use the word stable. I just say it means that 
if you're so stable, you don't want friends and you don't play well with your neighbors because you're so stable, you're independent by yourself and you don't play well in the sandbox. And that means that those saturated fats will, those saturated fats will make no chemical bonds with anything else. We have to have fats to be able to make hormones. We have to have fats to have the hormones that reduce inflammation, but to be able to have a fat to be able to make those nice hormones, it has to play. If it's so stable, it won't play in a chemical reaction, then you won't get those hormones. And if you don't have any other fats, then that means we have to use that saturated fat. So it will go through what's called the beta oxidation process, which is a six step chemical process to turn the saturated fat into an unsaturated fat. So it will play nicely with its neighbors. So a saturated fat is like, folded arms across the chest. I will have nothing to do with anybody. Leave me alone. I'm just going to go get stored on the body in some nice, quiet place. And if you want to have a chemical reaction with me, you're going to have to fundamentally change me. And that's what does happen. And when you go through the beta oxidation process, most people don't even understand when you you actually have to break bonds, these these single bonds, and then you have to make double bonds. When that type of chemical reaction happens, you create free radicals. You create electrons that are just bouncing around without a partner. Because believe me, every electron wants to have a mate. It has to have a mate. If it doesn't have a mate, it will go beat up somebody else and grab its mate because it's going to have a mate no matter what. You have to have paired electrons. And if you don't, you create a free radical. And so free radicals to get a mate will actually go at, I'm talking at huge speeds. Huge speeds will slam into a cell to rip away an a electron and it damages the cell when it slams into it. Now we have an injury, an injured cell. And so then we have to have inflammatory things to come in and try to say, so the section you off, we got to heal you, you know, and, and then, but then you also created another angry cell because it's lost an electron and it has to have electrons. So it'll slam itself into another cell to steal somebody else's electron. It's like an all out brawl. That's what saturated fats do to us, create all out brawls because one guy won't play nice, won't play at all. Just sits there with arm folded and say, leave me alone. Might as well and just eat like the unsaturated fat. <laughs> yes. If you just eat the unsaturated fats, all okay. You know, you're good. You're good. No brawls, no oxid. Well, I mean, we get oxidative stress from, you know, other ways. So might as well not eat it. Right. Yeah. Nice. Well, well told. I love that. The other big question that came in again and again and again, because it's such a big one is histamine intolerance and MCAS. What are we seeing such a rise in all of these food sensitivities and like people not being able to eat sulfur rich foods? What, what are your, what's your thought on it and where should people begin to look to, to, to get a handle on it? Quite honestly, I had a lot of histamines when I started working with you, I'd seen an allergist and the allergist was giving me drops because I was allergic to life at that point. And when I healed my gut with the protocol, I don't have all the histamine issues. I can literally eat anything. I choose protocol as a way of life, but it's not because I'm allergic to all these things anymore, which is really, really fascinating. Yep. Allergens are foreign proteins that are dead. We have foreign proteins that enter the body that are alive. It's bacteria, virus, fungal, and your body identifies something as alive or dead, a protein. And if it's identified as alive, then your body will make antibodies, antivirals against that particular, whatever it is, virus, and it will kill it off and you get rid of it. And then it creates memory cells to remember it. An allergen is different because it is a foreign protein that is not supposed to be circulating in your body. You're not supposed to have dog dander. You're not supposed to have whatever it is. Not saying all the regular foods that you eat, but it, the the stuff, the pollen from the trees, you know, the corn tasseling in the field, whatever it is. And so they enter the bloodstream and the body says, are you alive or dead? Because the body's going to identify this foreign protein because it's not a member of unique's body or or your body, Karen's body. It's not a member of your body. And every single cell in your body has an ID card to say, I belong to unique. I'm unique. And here's, look, here's my ID right here. Okay. Got my picture. Okay. And then we say, pass on, you're good. You belong to unique. But when these foreign proteins enter, if they're live proteins, they automatically get tagged and then they get shot down. They literally little cans that fire off and blow them out of the sky. But then these dead pieces of protein, it's like, you don't have an ID card. And they say, yeah, just go on your way, go on your way. Because 
you, you don't have an ID card, but we think that you're part of unique. Why? Because there's so many of you. Because you get so many of them. And why aren't you throwing them away? How are allergens cleared out of the human body? How do we get these foreign proteins cleared? Exactly. <laughs> Unique for those who are not watching. She she mouthed the word bile. bile. They are cleared out of the liver. They're placed into the bile. The bile goes to your gut. You eat soluble fiber in the form of beans and you throw that out of your body. And so then you don't have these gatherings. So as you will get older and older and older, it used to be doctors would say, oh, they're allergic as kids. They'll grow out of it. No, they grow. Now you're growing into more and more allergies because you never get rid of what you have. And so you have to start getting rid of those. And you'll say, but I can't eat beans because they're a high histamine food. Well, histamine is just, histamine is a protein, guys. It's a protein. It's just another protein. And so it's like, there's histamine in almost everything you eat. And so I can't have leftovers because leftovers are higher in, in histamine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you had been throwing away all of these foreign proteins that are dead, that cannot reproduce themselves, all these years, you would never have any of these issues. And then as your life goes on, you have all of these recycling proteins and histamines from when you were 10 years old, 12 years old, 14, 16, 18. Now you're in your 40s and you've got all of those circulating from a couple of decades ago, plus you're exposed to new ones. And then you just, you get to the straw that breaks the camel's back. It's like, if I have one more dead foreign protein enter my body, I cannot clean them all out of the bloodstream. My body just goes, oh, everything's an enemy. We're going to attack everything. You're all alive because obviously you're reprodu reproducing. There are so many of you. You're like a bacteria. You're reproducing, multiplying at these quick rates. So we're going to kill you and we're going to pull push out all these a histamine, which is a protein, and that's actually a cellular modulator that will actually kill the bacteria or the virus. But it wasn't a bacteria or virus. It's a piece of dead dog dander. Dog dander does not beget dog dander in your bloodstream. But because it's multiplying at such a great rate, they think it's alive. Your body mistakes it for being alive, but it's actually dead. So what's the answer? Take a Eat, while? Your... Eat your soluble fiber, oh, yeah. people. Can it take a while it to, take to a... get out of the cycle of your body over? Yes, it'll take a while. You, you, you can't get over it in a day because, yeah. you know, when we say eat beans, and first of all, people say the beans are too high in histamine. If you really do have a response to them, then do this, do this psyllium husk. You don't, psyllium has no histamine. It doesn't. And so you can do that. But, you know, we say, okay, eat your beans three times a day. That's excellent. But you recycle your bile, depending on the motility of the person, 20 to 72 times a day. So you eat beans three times a day. Good girl. Excellent. Well done. Well, you carry it three out of 20 times. So you the other 17 times, you recycle it all. And you say, well, I'll eat beans, you know, six times a day. Well, that's good. What if you're, you know, that's six out of 20 is better than three out of 20. But what if you're one of the ones that recycle it 72 times a day? Woo, we got a lot of eating the beans to go. I think I healed so quickly because your directive was, if you're awake, eat beans and well, I was so sick that I was only passing out for two hours a night. So I was eating beans 20, sometimes 22 hours a day. And I think like my and histamine got under control really quick because I was doing that for, a, you know, eight months, nine months where I was just, oh, I'm awake. I, I would, I would joke with my husband. I felt like a ghost walking the house, rattling the bowl with my beans. You know, I would just sit there eating my beans. <laughs> <laughs> like, and people are like, you but, need, were you insane? Is, I'm like, is, yeah, I was. <laughs> but that is what healed you because you carried out the vast majority of your bile. Yeah. Whether that percentage was you carried out 70% of it or you carried out 80% or 50%, but it's a whole lot better than only carrying out 10%. Yeah. Or three so, times a day or even six times a day. If you really have a major allergy scenario going on, you could be doing it you know, all waking hours. And it would probably like, how long would it, let's just say a person woke up and they were doing soluble fiber from the moment they woke up till the time they went to bed. How long, obviously how long is a piece of string? Each person's different, but roughly let's say a person did that. I did it for, you know, six, nine months or whatever I was doing it for. Cause I had, by the time I got to you, I had so many issues from being in chronic inflammation and illness for three years before I met you. And it took me another two years to go into total remission with the hormones and the gut, right? In, in total. So it was a five-year journey. And 
the histamines were off the charts. I would get heat rashes. I hair was falling out. Part of my issue with sleep was histamine because I was just jacked all the time. Um, you know, so I look at my case and I'm like, oh, I can eat anything now. I don't have food allergies anymore. It's more choice that I don't take in dairy. It's more choice that I don't eat certain things. Right. But so many people can get near them without having all sorts of skin rashes and stuff like that. What would you say to somebody like give it six months of just really staying dedicated or? Yes. Six months. It could happen a lot sooner though, too. Okay. I mean, you could see a different month. It depends on how many recycling allergens you have, how many years has this been going on? And so it, it is different. It's just like you said, how long is a piece of string? You know, it, it depends upon the person, but if people are, you know, people will talk to me and they'll say, I'm having an allergic reaction. The first thing I'll say is every 20 minutes, eat a tablespoon or two of beans every 20 minutes, every 20 minutes, because then you're going to carry out a hundred percent of your bile and all of that's caused whatever's causing the allergic reaction, whether it's an antibiotic, because antibiotics can cause an allergic reaction, or if it's the, the corn tasseling in the field, then we're going to be carrying that out at a hundred percent. And you can bring yourself out of a terrible, you know, now if you can't breathe, you're in anaphylactic shock, please go ahead and, you know, use your inhalers and give yourself the, you know, the, the shot, you know, you don't die, you know, say, well, I'm going to just, you know, don't, don't get so hard and that you say, I, I have to make sure beans are going to save me. It's just like, well, beans won't save you if you're not breathing. I mean, you know, if you're dead, you can't eat beans anymore. So, I mean, sometimes we have to use these medical interventions because some people are, are you know, go into anaphylactic shock, you know, type mm -hmm. of situations with allergies and then you just need to know beans need to be on the menu for me frequently often and they don't have to be large amounts just get down a few tablespoons but just eat them very often so you could bridge the gap while you're working on it with an antihistamine to keep yourself oh, afloat absolutely. yeah okay, absolutely and then what will happen is that you'll see that you know because usually people take antihistamines on a regular basis because if they don't take it, then they break out in the hives or whatever their reaction is. And it's just like, then they'll, they'll forget to take their antihistamine after a few weeks. It's like, Oh, I was supposed to take the antihistamine or it's, it's five hours later. They remember because then they're starting to get the hives again. It's just like, I went five hours that I normally couldn't go. And then pretty soon it's seven hours. And then pretty soon it's 10 hours. And then pretty soon it's like, I haven't taken antihistamine in a week. Hmm. In fact, I haven't taken antihistamine in months. What's mm -hmm. happening? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, you can definitely yeah. use concrete. That's a smart approach. But you're eating your beans all along. Yeah. yeah. It's a smart, you don't have to be miserable and, you know, scratching and then, you know, got the hives everywhere and, you know, it's yeah. terrible. You know, you don't oh. have to be miserable. It's no. horrible. The other big question was what causes a dry tongue? I had no idea. I was like, dry tongue. What would cause a dry tongue? Karen, what would cause a dry tongue? Well, the first thing is obviously water, but then some people will say, but I'm drinking three quarters of a gallon of water a day. That's adequate water. You don't have to drink more than that unless you have a job and you're on a roof and it's hot sun and it's in Arizona, you know, well then please. And then we'll have to put a little salt in your water too, because you're not going to have enough sodium either. But if it's not dehydration, it's because of the lack of fats, the lack of good fats. Oh, lack of good fats. Fats would cause a dry tongue. Whoa. Talk to me about that. Yes, because all of our, all of our dermal tissue, our skin, and that includes anything that is exposed, lips, tongue, anything that has some type of exposure to the outside, okay, air, you know, that's not enclosed in an internal body. The main constituent of those tissues are fats. And if mm -hmm. you don't have sufficient fat, then you won't, you know, it's going someplace in your body, but you not just don't have tongue. enough fats or hair, not the tongue. Hmm. That yeah. would seem like a really uncomfortable place to have dry. What and about the metallic for, taste? The metallic taste, yeah, I'm going to go back to the dry tongue and, and then I'll go to the metallic taste. People need to also look at medications they're taking because we're, I'm giving you answers based upon the person is on no Nothing. medications because it is very common to have a dry tongue depending on lots of medications give you that side effect. So check your med side effect list first, and then okay. you'll know that. Metallic tongue is almost always because of the bile regurgitating back up into your 
it, bile is released from the gallbladder into the duodenum, and then it goes back, it backwashes through the pyloric sphincter, and then it comes up through the stomach and up through the esophagus, and then it, it can come back up into your mouth. If any pregnant women, you know this, it happens all the time. You can feel the bile gurgling up in your throat. You can even throw it up. It's very bitter tasting. It is ugly looking, and it is slimy. <laughs> and anyway, welcome to the world of bile. That is what bile is, because it's a fat, and it's carrying out all this fat soluble waste. And the metallic taste is almost always from a liver issue that you have bile that is too noxious. And because we all regurgitate some bile, it's just part of the natural process of, of our plumbing. <laughs> we are, we're plumbed. <laughs> we are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, arthrosis, a de degenerative disease of the bones. Protocol mm -hmm. can help this. Oh, absolutely. Your bones are a matrix of proteins and collagen. And so all of those things are found in our diet. And so when your bones degenerate, it means that it's a web matrix. And so then, and then calcium is laid down in the little holes of the matrix and that's how bone is made. But that matrix has to be intact and that's made from collagen and it's made from protein and collagen. Where are you going to get collagen from vitamin C? Where do you get vitamin C? Would you just eat your vegetables? Would you eat your peppers, your green peppers and your red peppers, especially red peppers even have more vitamin C. A red pepper has more vitamin C than an orange mm -hmm. and 10 times less sugar, you know? So you just, we, we eat a good diet. And, and then bones you can will take have a couple of years, right? Is arthrosis an inflammatory condition? Two years, two years for bones. Is that a arthrosis is a inflam? Is that an autoimmune condition of the bones? Well, osteoporosis is not an autoimmune. That is, you have torn down the either the matrix or you have removed the calcium that's filling in the matrix. And mm -hmm. calcium removal is done because of caffeine and herbal tea consumption because people say oh well I just drink herbal teas I don't drink and then they'll say and I drink green tea and I drink Earl Grey they, they think that's well that you call it herbal tea if you want to but it's highly caffeinated they say well I don't drink any caffeinated teas but you forgot about the theophyllines theophyllines are even more powerful than caffeine of a diuretic and stripping a diuretic will always strip calcium out of your bones so, so arthritis, and, and maybe, yeah is the other name for osteoarthritis maybe, I see that okay yeah. Yeah. There's osteoarthritis. And so that means that there's rheumatoid arthritis, which means it can shift around your pain can, Oh, now it's in my left foot. Oh, now it's in my right hip. Now it's in my left shoulder. Oh, it's in my neck. It's wherever it can shift around. And it's inflammation. Osteoarthritis is usually in one particular joint. It's in my left knee. And mm -hmm. it's because the bone has been broken down and then you're working on a bone that's worn down and you've lost the cartilage. And so it's just rub, 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 rub. Well, what happens when you have rub, rub, rub? You have inflammation. And that inflammation is the arthritis part of it. But it's because your bone was breaking down. It's like I was telling you about the flanges in the, in the varicose veins. When it becomes inflamed, nothing works well anymore. And so then it's very painful and you got to reduce the inflammation and got to regrow the bone. Get rid of the teas, get rid of the caffeines, get rid of the things that are stripping minerals, calcium from the bones, get rid of the things that are creating inflammation in the body, the sugars, clean yeah. up the diet. If you want to have healthy bones and joints and is what I'm hearing. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Dark yes. circles under the yes. eyes, Karen. I've had those my whole life. I know a lot of people get them. Is it just the, the, the skin is thin under there? Like what's the deal? People go, it's liver. Your liver is not working correct. When I was sick, I had really dark circles, but it I wasn't. It has nothing sick. to do with the liver. Okay. It has nothing to do with the liver. It's one, not enough sleep is the most common reason is that you don't get enough sleep. And then, then the second most common reason is allergies. Oh, that's interesting because I get about eight hours now. I'm a real good sleeper, which is surprising because yeah. perimenopause, I feel like I've gone through cycles where I don't sleep as well and I sleep lighter, like I'm more light, but it, okay. So, and are some people just born with darker circles or do you think that's a real sign of- Maybe it can be the contours of your face too that create shadows for you too. I mean, because yeah. you can- pull it down? Does that dark shadow come with it? Are you actually pulling down a discolored piece of skin or is it go away? Is it part of the contour of the face mm -hmm. and a wrinkle? Mm -hmm. And as we get old, we do get, I mean, it is what happens is our face wrinkles and yeah. Yeah. There's because no we, escaping that one. <laughs> nope. 
All, every one of us, even Karen Hurd, is going to die. I'm hoping it'll be close to 120 or at 120 or a few days past that. But I mean, we only can live. I mean, there is a cap on there's an end cap on those those chromosomes. And when that's gone, you cannot make a new cell of that cell. And then but if we are living the cell, longest we've ever lived, right? Like it's somebody was saying, how did women go through menopause before? And I heard someone say women didn't live a long, long enough to go into menopause quite often. We are living much, much longer than what we used to live before. Although if you look at recent, depends, I've been doing a lot of studies in, in demographics and different, you know, populations, but Recently in the U.S., we have even been seen, depending on where you live in the U.S., we've seen the lifespan start to take a dip again and start to decrease some. Mm -hmm. But it used to be, yeah, we die in our 50s. I mean, very common in the tropics where, you know, or where people are living off of fruit. I mean, people say, oh, you can live on fruit. Just think of the people in the tropics. They just go pick the fruit off the tree. They're dying in their 50s. Mm -hmm. You know, it's because it's a lot of sugar. It's a whole lot of sugar. Yeah. You know, and so, it, 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 yeah, we have some of the longest lifespans, but I mean, at the turn of the century, the, uh, you know, not the 20, the 21st century, but of the 20th century in the early 1900s, people weren't living into their 70s. If you lived to 60, you were old and, you know, wow. But now, so is, yeah. So is menopause kind of this, I mean, it hasn't been very, a lot of female things haven't been studied all that well, but the female brain, this neuroscientist wrote a book studying the female brain through perimenopause and menopause, and they can see what a massive transformation happens in the brain from losing estradiol, like this major shift. Did you feel a shift in your brain during that time? Because I definitely feel changes. I can't put my finger on it, but I feel changes. There are some changes, but there are not many. Now, you have to understand that I've been eating well for a long, mm -hmm. long time, or yeah. 30 plus years. You know, somebody asked me, it was just yesterday, I was at an event, and it was another representative that said, Karen, I never see you drink coffee, because they're, they're, they're at, I'm at a table, we were doing a dedication of a science building at one of the universities here in Wisconsin, and and they said, I never see you in the assembly or anywhere, so you never drink coffee. When was the last cup of coffee you had? said, I've never had coffee. I've never had one cup in my entire life because I was raised by a father who thought that drinking coffee was a sin. And so I know it's not a sin, but anyway, that's what my father saw. So I grew up without coffee and then I just never picked it up. And then I became a nutritionist and found out how so bad, why would I start it? So I've never had a cup of coffee in my life. You know, people say, well, haven't you had a beer? I've never had a beer. I don't even know what beer tastes like. I don't mm. care what beer tastes like. I don't, I don't need to know that because I know that beer is immediately converted into a triglyceride, even faster than sugar. Why would I do that? Mm -hmm. How, what, what, what do I want to drink? Just give me a good glass of clean, purified water. Thank give me some water. <laughs> give me water. That is my only beverage. I don't drink teas, just water. Well, it's so, a good one. I mean, it's keeping the blood healthy, keeping the body hydrated. So it's, yeah, I, I was out with a friend today and she said, Unique, it's hard to be single and not drink. And her mom had breast cancer and her grandma had breast cancer. She's after 40. And I was like, you know, when you look at the data on women after 40 and breast cancer and drinking alcohol, like it's not. And she's like, well, how do you, how do you date? And how do you, and I was like, you just ask for sparkling water. <laughs> I mean, sparkling water is fine. People say, oh, sparkling water is bad. No, it's not. All it is is water and it's got some CO2 gas. It's just carbonation. Yeah. And people yeah. say, oh, CO2 gas is bad. No, it's not. You, it goes right to carbonic acid and flip back to, you burp it up. I mean, when you're burping it up, it's just carbon dioxide. Guess what? That's what, you know, it's, it's our whole world. We breathe out carbon dioxide all the time. And by the way, the trees breathe in that carbon dioxide. All plants breathe in carbon dioxide and then they release oxygen. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful system. It's a it's wonderful amazing. system. I have a couple rapid fires for you before I let you go. Dried roasted chicory tea. Yay or nay? No. Uh, nay. Carob, yay or nay? No, don't eat it. Wow. Is it because it's sweet? It doesn't have caffeine in it. It doesn't have caffeine in it, but it still has other stimulants in it. Mm -hmm. And so does the chicory. It's poor man's coffee, but it still gives you a lift. If you don't believe me, have a cup of chic chicory and you will see it's like, 
I sort of got, and because you're so well right now, unique, you start to get a little bit of panicky, you know, anxiety. It's like, what causes this? That's your chicory. That's your carob. If you don't believe me, go have something with carob. And then you are going to go, oh not my big, gosh. Not, honestly, not a big fan of the taste of carob personally. I don't, I've never tried roasted chicory tea. It sounds kind of nasty to me personally, but you know, I like people are looking for that morning cup of something. So, and then what about mesquite coffee made out of the mesquite no. tea family? No mesquite. Thoughts on sauna use. What are your thoughts on sauna? Saunas are okay. The heat's okay, but just be careful on the de dehydration piece mm. on it so that you, so because if you come out of there and you're weak and you're shaking and you have a dry tongue and you're not on medications or, you know, it's just like, okay, did you take in enough water? But saunas, the heat itself is good. Just don't overdo it. Okay. Okay. And then somebody asked, does Botox and filler leave the body via the bile or does it get stuck in the body and does it ever leave? It does leave and it does Definitely. leave by the bile. By the bile. Okay. Yes. And then the last thing is more, I wanted to share with you and think, get your thoughts on it than anything. But I had a client who was getting repeated yeast infections and didn't want to take antibiotics, hadn't worked with you or me. And she took a piece of garlic and she popped it up in her, and it, it, it was a full clove. It didn't have any bits missing. So not, none of the, and, and she woke up the next day and her yeast infection was gone. Yes. <laughs> no, you yes, can't garlic it. it's sulfuric acid. It is very deadly. It will kill a yeast infection. But if it garlic clove had been cut or it nicked wasn't in cut. any way. And it wasn't nicked. Yeah. Right. Oh. <laughs> If, if it had been cut or nicked, burn, baby, burn. I but mean, it, it was protect, all the shell was on it, she said. Because I was like, because I then it made me think like. Skin on the garlic. It will still, I mean, it's just like if you can smell garlic through the skin. I mean, you know, yeah. you can smell a bulb of garlic if it's just sitting on your cabinet and, you know, yeah. it's got all the skin on. Because garlic is very potent and it will travel through that skin. But if it had been cut garlic, oh no, don't do that, ladies. That'll burn you. But yes, garlic is a very powerful, it will kill yeast. Yes. I mean, could you, I need to uh, credit you because I knew from you that garlic on, on skin can kill a skin cancer. And a friend of mine had skin cancer on his face and he was set for surgery. And I was like, cool for the next two weeks while you wait to get surgery, why don't you just cut a piece and put it on there a couple of times a day for the next two weeks, just as an experiment. He did it. He went in for surgery and his surgeon was like, I can't find the cancer on your face. It's gone. I don't know what happened. We have pictures of it. It's right there. And he was just like, okay, so we're good here. Yeah, we're good here. Come back in three months to check it. And I was, he, he was like, unique. It worked. And I was like, wow, that's so cool. It was work right in the middle of his it little worked. face too. Would have been, had a big yeah. cut out of his face. So it's pretty amazing. But yeah, the, the garlic and the vagina, I was like, that's a, that's a risky game right there. Well, it'll work. And people should know too, that, you know, they're listening to this because a lot of times you get overzealous to say, well, I will tape on a piece of garlic on my face and I'll leave it there for, you know, 24 hours. Don't do that. It will burn a hole. And then you will have this bleeding and it will heal. But I mean, you just have to do this for a short period of time. You know, I had a guy with a, with cancer underneath his eye, it was skin cancer and garlic when you, and it has to be cut so that it's powerful. I, he barely hold it on there, but for just a short period of time, because it's the fume, they're making his eyes water. And just did that once a day, all cleared up the same story you just gave. He went in and the doctor to have it removed and they said, where is it? It's not even there. It's gone. It's gone. Yeah. And it's, you don't get, always get that kind of opportunity in our, in our field to get some to talk to somebody before they have it. So that, that opportunity, I couldn't pass it by. I was like, do this, try this. I want to see what's going to happen. I do have one more question. If you have time, the people with multiple peen at night, is that a hormone problem? If, especially if they're stopping to have water before they go to bed and, but they're up all night peeing, shouldn't there be, doesn't the brain shut down your connection to the bladder when you sleep at night so that you don't wake up all night to pee? It's a very normal thing to get up at the night to go to the bathroom. Like it's once? So, no one don't twice? think well, it depends on the person. If you are a high adrenaline producing person, you're on the go all the time. And so, yes, you're going to fall asleep at night, but it's not like your brain just shuts off. You're still in a, an elevated gear compared to maybe someone that's more relaxed, easygoing. And then women also, after you've had several children, then usually your bladder has dropped. And so that comes into play also. 
how much water you are drinking, how much salt you're taking in. Salt causes you to retain water. I mean, there's there's many factors, but there's nothing wrong with you. I mean, the only thing that it can be bothersome, and you just get up and go to the bathroom, go back to sleep. I mean, it's not any big deal. But if you can't go back to sleep, then you really know that you're up because your busy brain is going because you have got too much going on, too much hormones there. Okay, and that's so when soluble you need fiber. <laughs> That's right. That's what you just want. All you ladies up at night, take that husk. I, I actually still to this day from being on the protocol for so long, I put, I have a jar of soluble fiber by the bed already immersed in water. So if I need it, cause I, I'm, my nature isn't changed just because I'm not taking in the stimulants doesn't mean I'm not a hummingbird still. So I have to be careful with my, it's a way of life for me. I, and I, t people say, well, you shouldn't rely on soluble fiber. I'm like, people rely on food. People rely on all kinds of things. I don't rely on it to use the bathroom. I rely on it to keep an equilibrium because I naturally am, I'm a, I'm a little crazy weasel. It's just, it's just, it's a food. I'm laughing because it's just like a person says, you shouldn't rely on that. Well, unique, you shouldn't be eating food. Why are you relying on food? You should just run like a machine without any gas or any oil. No food. It's just ridiculous. It's just yeah. like, no well, Karen, you've been generous with your time and you are so kind and funny and I just adore and appreciate you. And I can't wait for everyone to hear their questions answered. We didn't get to a lot of them, but we'll save it for another time. Okay. Thank you. Sounds good. Have yes, a wonderful night, to Karen. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening to my Q&A session with Karen. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. You got your questions answered. And even if you do get your questions answered, it's not always the answer that we're looking for, obviously. But some, on some innate level, I think a lot of this stuff really just resonates as true simplicity. You know, and it's it, what always strikes me is it's not what we do some of the time. It's what we do all of the time. And if what we're doing all of the time is leading to us being in a suboptimal state, then looking at the pieces on the plate, on the table, in the rituals is really a wonderful place to begin changing our habits to fit the kind of health that we want to create for ourselves. And, you know, oftentimes it's up in the head where the work needs to be done because feeling better is such an incredible gift and there is nothing restrictive about feeling better. Quite often it's more the emotional states that drive habits versus our, you know, what we want for our best health and what feels good and what feels best. So staying with protocol all these years hasn't been hard, but I'm also not, you know, I'm 90-10. I give myself leeway to experiment. And quite honestly, when I do experiment, I usually come back to just 100% because at this state, I feel so clean and clear that when I deviate, I notice my body responding and not necessarily in a positive way. It doesn't mean that I couldn't do it anyway. Like, put it this way. I love caffeine. I would, you know, give a pinky if I could live on caffeine or have it a part of my life on a regular basis, but it dysregulates me to such incredible levels that eating this way has only shown me how pronounced it is. So it just doesn't work for me. But my mind wants it to, you know, there's a disconnect. It's like my mind's like, yay, we're high as a kite. What are you? And my nervous system is like, whoa, dysregulated. So it's just getting honest with ourselves. And, you know, what's interesting is my husband doesn't even notice caffeine in his body most of the time. And I'm like, how's that even possible? that one can be so adapted to pushing that kind of adrenaline because, yeah, my body does not adapt. Anyway, thank you for joining me. I have now a Patreon account if you would like to donate to the podcast to keep it going. I do dedicate my own time and resources to creating this podcast. Also, I'll link the Patreon account here. And I will be making gear, being protocol gear. I also have a newsletter. If you want to go to my webpage, yourgreat.com, you can sign up for it. And I am considering making my podcast live so that people can join it live and I can get questions ahead of time so that you can be a part of the live recording of the podcast. If this sounds interesting to you, please sign up for my newsletter. All right. Have an awesome day. 
and I hope you're taking care of yourself wherever you are in this incredible world. <laughs>